Here we are. It's Thursday. It's the last Thursday of term and the last Litsock of the uh, Lent term. Welcome, everybody. And this week it's on Frankenstein and then on to a discussion about literary monsters. Um, and I've, Mr. Humphreys, picked off the um, shelves, The Monsters We Deserve by Marcus Sedgwick. And this is Marcus Sedgwick up in the Alps, which has a link to Frankenstein and uh, meditating on the book and other things. And I've just opened it at random. And he says, I do not sleep again, not this night. I ask myself this, do monsters always stay in the book where they were born? Are they content to live out their lives on paper and never step foot into the real world? It's very late before the sun creeps over the mountain opposite and shows itself, by which time I've been clinging to the grey dawn for hours beaten and drawn, beaten and drawn. So he's sort of channeling Victor Frankenstein, creator of the creature, the uh, eponymous hero of, the Frank of Frankenstein. Uh, and uh, this is a book really worth exploring for uh, about loneliness, about literature, and about um, how we create monsters and are haunted by them. Okay. So, here is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley wrote two uh, versions of Frankenstein. One when she was 18, a mere slip of a girl, although extremely erudite and um, informed one because she'd had a very uh, interesting um, education. Not only was she the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, um, who was almost one of the first feminist writers, Vindication of the Rights of Women, and her father, William, Gold, William Godwin, was a philosopher and thinker and uh, quite a dominating presence uh, in her life. And uh, she got involved with Percy Bysshe Shelley, another dominating male, um, who was a poet, vegetarian, atheist at a time when atheism was actually forbidden by law. Um, and uh, she and he... Um, her stepsister and Lord Byron ended up, I expect you know the legend, don't you, Lulu, in Siena, ended up on Lake Geneva in 1816, which was the year without a summer, because uh, there'd been a massive uh, volcano in uh, Indonesia, and so um, the skies were grey, there were no, um, there was virtually no uh, sun whatsoever that summer and um, lots of famine etc anyway they had this competition and two books came out of that one was Frankenstein and the other was Vampire by John Polidori who was Byron's doctor um, so Frankenstein and has a subtitle The Modern Prometheus uh, that famous or infamous myth from Greece Titan who steals fire um, and brings it to man and uh, so rebels against the gods. And then the other text that's um, at the back of Frankenstein is Paradise Lost, um, because the creature uh, learns his language and learns to read through listening and uh, obtaining a copy of Paradise Lost by John Milton. And um, Milton writes about Adam, who's eventually banished from uh, Paradise, and so we've got an epigraph on the beginning. Did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mould me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to remote me? Uh, the old, old question. Do we ask to be born? And if we, asked, if we are born, should we not be cared for? Frankenstein is a really interesting text because written in the white heat of her adolescence, as it were, Mark Steele makes um, as a comedian always makes the point that when you were doing um, uh, cannabis or you were having a lovely time down the pub, she was writing this seminal novel that's still being talked about today in the 21st century. Um, in other words, we can never measure up, really. Uh, and it's um, an extraordinary combination of the first science fiction novel, philosophical novel, um, almost travel novel, because we start in a journey uh, the uh, narrator is a man called Walton who's in St Petersburg and about to go off on an arctic voyage and whilst on this arctic voyage he meets Victor Frankenstein our eponymous hero and then his Victor Frankenstein's creation 
who looks like nothing on earth, is enormous in stature, and a victor calls him a monster, and the poor creature calls himself a uh, wretch, uh, because he's been um, an outcast from his parent, Frankenstein. And it's about forbidden knowledge and overreaching, and how we have to beware of um, too much uh, pursuit of knowledge and obsessiveness. Um, there is an element of uh, being involved with somebody who was utterly obsessive about various things. First of all, it was vegetarianism, it was the lack of God, poetry, and then eventually it was sailing, which led to his uh, eventual demise. Um, and um, poor Mary. And also buried in here is um, the secrets of creation. Poor Mary, by the time she wrote this, had already had two children, both of whom had died. And... Um, and her own mother died in childbirth, giving birth to her. So it's also uh, about family and parenting and um, how we're born into the world, knowing nothing and how we develop. So I will read a little for you to give you an idea. She did look at it again in 1831 when she was a grown woman with one child left, Victor, uh, not Victor, Percy had died uh, when he was about 26 in a boating accident in Italy. She came back and uh, she had to support herself and her family by uh, her own pen, uh, which was not easy for a woman in those days. Uh, so um, she, was, she was something else. She really was um, quite extraordinary, following in her mother's footsteps. Okay. Also, um, <coughs> Diana? Percy calcified heart until she died. Yes. Um, oh, wow. The love of her life. Um, so, this is... I'm trying to find what I'm doing here. Okay. The creature, because he's been rejected by many people, he looks absolutely hideous. Lulu, do you want to tell us what he sort of looks like? He's got yellow teeth. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's got really white teeth because um, he got the teeth from all sorts of skulls. Mm. Um, he's got like bloodshot eyes. He's got um, he's been made to buy all these different bits and pieces, so he's got like scars all over him. Um, I think he's bald. No, he's got long black lustrous locks, oh, right. okay. um, which does seem really odd uh, if you think about it. You wouldn't expect that. He's not. He's never normally depicted like that. But he's not beautiful, is he? Mm. No. He, Victor thinks that he's this amazing-looking thing until, until he comes alive. He's yes. like, oh my god. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, it um, it's really sad. Um, and here's their encounter after uh, he's rejected him, and the poor creature has been rejected by other people as well. As I said this, I suddenly beheld the figure of a man at some distance, advancing towards me with superhuman speed. This is Victor talking. He bounded over the crevices in the ice among which I had walked with caution. His stature, all his approach, seemed to exceed that of man. Now where they are is the Valley de Glace. Now the Valley de Glace is where Marcus Sedgwick, uh, up in the Al French Alps, took his family to live before uh, the snow dis and ice disappeared altogether. We talked about that in a previous um, lit sock. And sad to say, the, the um, situation out there with climate change is not at all good. But it would meant Alps and mountains meant a great deal to the Romantics as a place of sublimity, of power of nature. And that's where uh, we see the creature the first time. His stature also, as he approached, seemed to exceed that of man. I was troubled. A mist came over my eyes and I felt a faintness seize me, but I was quickly restored by the cold gale of the mountains. I perceived as the shape came nearer, sight tremendous and abhorred, that it was the wretch whom I had created. I trembled with rage and horror, resolving to wait his approach and then close with him in mortal combat. Now, Victor is, you know, your average man. He's not very big and we've got this superhuman sort of titan coming towards him so you can imagine who's not going to win. His countenance bespoke bitter anguish combined with disdain and malignity while its unearthly ugliness rendered it almost too horrible for, for human eyes. 
I scarcely observed this. Rage and hatred had at first deprived me of utterance, and I covered only to overwhelm me with words expressive of furious detestation, detestation and contempt. There is absolutely no empathy, is there, for this poor creation at all? Devil, I exclaimed, do you dare approach me, and do not you fear the fierce vengeance of my arm wreaked on your miserable head? Be gone, vile insect, or rather stay, that I may trample you to dust. And oh, that I could, with the extinction of your miserable existence, restore those victims who you knew so diabolically it murdered. I expected this reception, said the daemon. All men hate the wretched. How then must I be hated, who am miserable beyond all living things? Yet you, my creator, detest and spurn me, thy creature, to whom thou art bound by ties, only dissoluble by the annihilation of one of us. You purpose to kill me. How dare you sport thus with life? Do your duty towards me, and I will do mine towards you and the rest of mankind. If you will comply with my conditions, I will leave them and you at peace. But if you refuse, I will glut the more of death until it be satiated with the blood of your remaining friends. He's already killed um, members of um, Victor's family in revenge for his being spurned. And now he's insisting that he wants, he wants something. In fact, what he wants is a companion. And that's the only way that he'll leave him. Victor, of course, is not listening to anything. Um, he's that kind of person. Um, when the National Theatre put on a version with Benedict Cumberbatch and Johnny Lee Miller, and they alternated the um, playing of the creature and Victor, Victor was played as absolutely, completely emotionless, wasn't he? He just had no understanding of what this creature, what his creation had gone through. Um, he he was supposed to get married, didn't happen. The creature killed his um, uh, wife on her, we her wedding night. Um, and uh, he still, he just hates, he doesn't, he's got really no concept of love or affection or, or duty to something that you've got responsibility for. And this poor uh, creature made out of dead parts has to go on alone. And what's even worse is that because he looks so awful, um, he's just othered all the time. Um, so he's become a sort of prototype for for racism, for um, people who are different um, and yet have feelings and education and, and you know, a right to be heard. Um, and so um, he's the classic sort of monster. Um, and the first film of this in 1931 with um, Boris Karloff uh, makes it clear he's got stitches across his head, he's got a square head, must have taken hours in makeup, very short bros on bros um, uh, hair and a bolt through his neck, which is where the electricity is supposed to have gone in, in the laboratory. Um, because the times they were fascinated with the power of electricity and its ability to make uh, bodies sort of rise again. Um, so it remains, and it's I think a lot of people think of that when they think of Frankenstein. Yeah, film. absolutely. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I think it was this week I discovered that Boris Karloff's name was in fact something like Harry Potts or something weirdly, but he was um, he was not um, German, as it suggests. Um, so I've got here the Kennel Guide, fabulous guide to the novel. Um, and it makes clear that what Victor is trying to find is the secret of eternal life uh, by going into death. And death, because uh, it's a barrier that you know nobody really can cross um, or come back from, it's this unanswered questions, this unexplored. And he, 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 in the first part of the novel, Victor pursues alchemical, alchemical knowledge alchemical <laughs> alchemical, alchemical knowledge uh, which is something that JK Rowling picks up in the Philosopher's Stone uh, that secret of immortal life the way of perhaps turning lead into gold uh, chemistry and um, uh, biology put together oh there's there's Boris Karloff does he speak in the movie? sorry does he speak in the movie mm, no he doesn't He's, it's very, very different. It's a completely different way of depicting this novel. Um, it's, it's almost, it's a silent film, um, and all you see are people, um, are his, his violence and people being utterly afraid of him and destruction. 
Um, so it's a very sort of truncated version. Um, uh, and the real uh, sort of um, spectacular is on the laboratory, and that goes on right up until the sort of 1950s, where uh, lots of things happen in the um, laboratory. So the, the philosophy and the um, things about parenting are sort of gone. Um, and of course, you can always ask, uh, ask the question, is Victor Frankenstein the actual monster, no. since he, ha he has no idea of how to parent at all? So, having started with Marcus Sedgwick, do the monsters continue beyond the novel? Yes, they do. We've got a new book, um, actually about Sher Mary Shelley, called Monsters, The Passion and Loss That Created Frankenstein. And uh, it's a, um, a fictionalisation of uh, the circumstances that led to the novel's creation, um, starting back at uh, the family home where... Uh, Mary has a stepmother uh, who she doesn't get on with and an extended family who um, doesn't get on with either. Um, so I shall definitely be exploring that mm -hmm. one. Be yep, good. Yeah, of course. By um, it, uh, interesting. Exactly. Yeah. And, of course, there are other things as well. I put out, I've got out, we've got out the lie tree, the monster calls, which is sort of a mixture of the green man, the yew tree, and um, almost death, stalking. We got also, um, I put, picked out Shadow of the Minotaur, the original monster in the labyrinth that um, we never know about. Um, and uh, with his tribute of um, people from Athens, and well, that's the modern version. This dark that's endeavor. Oh, Frankenstein. right, it's another Frankenstein. Okay, this dark endeavor. The purest intentions can stir up the darkest obsessions. Okay, right, so it's a prequel. All oh, right. Okay. As a younger man. As a younger man, yep. Treacherous search for the ingredients to the forbidden elixir of life. Yep. The impossible odds, dangerous alchemy, and a bitter love triangle. Ooh. <laughs> I think he gives mm -hmm. him a twin. Sorry, Hannah. It, he's got like a twin. He's got a twin. Yeah. Yeah. So that doppelganger element of the gothic novel as well. Um, that's great. We picked out. Um, what else we picked out? We picked out we got the Hobbit, the, you know, Hobbit for Smog. 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 I call him Smog. You call him Smog. You call him Smog. You Smog. Uh, dragons. Plenty of dragons. You got Aragorn. Gothic. Arrogan, Dracula. How to train your dragon. Absolutely. Dracula. Smog if you think it's Smog. Or you can say more of Dora. I don't know what Professor Tolkien said. Whatever Professor Tolkien said when he... That's the definitive answer. Yeah. So we've got... People have brought monsters, haven't they? Yes, you everyone's got something to Maybe you can start? You can swap seats okay. with me? Okay. So I have brought along um, the Hands of Baskerville, one of uh -huh. the Sherlock Holmes books, because I love Sherlock Holmes. Um, it's definitely one of the lot more kind of horror, kind of like monster. Um, of This is basically off Wikipedia because I couldn't really find much. Um <laughs> Read it, you? Yeah, I have yeah. read it. I just. What are your impressions of it? Yeah. What Wikipedia says. <laughs> yeah, but um, so basically there is this family, the Baskerville family, who live in Dartmoor, and there is a legend that um, there's this hound roaming um, the grounds, and that it kills all of the heirs to the house of Baskerville, and so one of um. I think it's Charles Baskerville, um, one of the fam family members of the Baskerville family, is found dead, and um, and Sherlock Holmes is told that it's a heart attack, but on his face there was an expression of pure terror, and that there were hound footprints by the body. Um, it's it's really good. I think it's definitely one of my favourites, and. It was actually voted one of the favourites, I think. I don't know, it's like mm -hmm. 1990 something. Mm -hmm. um, and it's definitely like, there's obviously a lot of adaptations of it, like, mm -hmm. B like BBC Sherlock Holmes, which is my favourite TV show. Um, they had the Hands of Basketball one, a similar sort of style, but they kind of adapted it a little bit to make it uh, more modern with like. Yes, there's things a towards like nuclear it's like animal testing, testing kind of yeah. place mm -hmm. so they just like make mutant yeah. animals um, but it's there's definitely kind of a lot because when I 
because when I read it, I thought this, and I read it, and I thought, oh, this is really good. Watch the TV vision. They made it so much more scarier. Um, Hell to Basketball is really good, and what do you mean? It's a hound. It's a wolf, kind mm-hmm. of wolf, kind of dog. Um, I mean, but it's also like it's also there's obviously still quite a lot of mystery in it because even with the dog prints. They are suspicious of someone else. I'm not going to say who. Um, it's got a good ending. Yeah, it has got yeah. it has got a good ending. It's really good. It's kind of sad the ending, mm. I think, um, but it is it's quite good and it is quite a scary one to read and watch. Mm-hmm. So it's, I definitely. It's probably the single most famous Sherlock Holmes story. Mm. Yeah, I would say it's the one that everyone remembers when you think of a Sherlock Holmes story that's probably yeah. the first one you think of mm. I think it's the third one I read because I it's got lots of tropes that continue lots yeah. of got the Marsh mm. lots of other authors have used the Marsh as well Dartmoor itself Dartmoor it's got creepy tours yeah very ancient landscape. I think Dartmoor like is like a really nice setting for like a horror mm. it's got like all the it's got the hills it's got all the valleys and especially in those valleys you don't always know what goes no, on yeah. so it's creepy it's dark it's wide yes open spaces. it's good yeah. it's a good book yeah, yeah that's pretty much it okay, great thank you that's brilliant, brilliant. Is it your favorite um it's it is one of my favorite ones i think it's between that and studying scarlet really that's I, my least favorite <laughs> no <laughs> i like studying scarlet because just because of the i the plot is in the way like because when i because after I read it, I started noticing it a lot more when I reread it. I was like, oh, now this makes sense. Um, I think that's a good one, but I think Hands of Baskerville is definitely up there. Although I can sort of understand why it is your least favourite. It is like... <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a giant wolf roaming the f- fields of Dartmoor doesn't make any sense. That's true. <laughs> it goes with the mythical landscape, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and you've got the prisoners from Princetown and also sort of entrapment, haven't we, as well. Mm. And, um, and the heir that's come from abroad, so he's completely de- mystified by this sort of bizarre <laughs> behaviour of Britain, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. and especially yeah. of Sherlock Holmes. Mm. Just a weird person who seems to know everything. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I have to, uh, in certain ways. He, d- he doesn't know certain things. He's yeah. completely ignorant no. about other things. Mm. Such as I to be a human being sometimes. There, there is, there <laughs> Emotions. He, he doesn't like, I don't think he likes to be seen as a, a regular human being. No. He doesn't act like one, but. Centric, to say the least. Yes. Yes. Very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivi. Yes. yes. Thank you. Mm. You can match your person. Yeah, and he's going to gradually work away. I chose. Uh, the Crimes of Brundleward. Oh, excellent. Um, the Spellbinding Cinematic Tour. And it's a book, but it's kind of like telling us like about what happens in the film. So like for the first part, it's got like the story so far. So like if people haven't seen the first film, it kind of like tells them about it. And then... Um, through it, it introduces, so on each page, well not each page, it introduces a new character and a new monster. So like one of them, you've got the Thestral, um, which is then bonded with the character um, who was under Dangerous Times. So I think this character is part of Slytherin. Um, <laughs> And it tells you about what the um, beast is used for. So the stroll is used for the carriages and riding and has the prints of sort of horse, but horseshoe, but sort of clamped together, yeah. sort of like that. Okay. And yeah, and it also kind of gives you a shock of what to expect, but kind of explains what happens next in a way that doesn't tell you. So it's sort of show don't tell. And it's a really good book. And also it kind of introduces more characters who wouldn't really be in the book but are who really or but who are really sort of important. Um for like Newt's assistance, I don't think she's in the books, but she is kind of important because she loves um it says here that her name is Bunty 
and she loves animals just as much as Newt. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. J.K. Rowling link. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hannah, do you want to put Eleanor's um, yeah. Oh, Eleanor's yeah. contribution. This isn't my contribution. This is Eleanor's. Very nicely, mm -hmm. Hannah is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Eleanor, if you're there. Hi, Eleanor. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I, she's, I can't pronounce Cthulhu. The oh, Cthulhu. H.P. Lovecraft. Good one. Yes. Um, when she thinks of monsters, one of the first creatures that comes to mind is, drum roll, I'm not going to do the drum roll, <laughs> Cthulhu, <laughs> an ancient dragon sea monster of the deep. Mm -hmm. But to properly understand the call of Cthulhu, you must first understand its author, H.P. Lovecraft, who was a bit of a weirdo, mm -hmm. and not that great, but he inspired a genre of horror called Lovecraftian horror, mm -hmm. a subgenre of horror that emphasises the horror of the horror, the horror of the horror. <laughs> and the unknowable and incomprehensible, mm -hmm. with themes of cosmic dread, madness, and fear of the unknown. This is where Call of Cthulhu comes in. Written in 1928, it follows our narrator, Francis Thurston, as he recounts his discovery of notes left behind by his uncle. Um, and then it goes to the bit with his uncle, um, like a flashback, archeological society, where a police officer asks the assembled antiquitarians to identify an idol, idol carved from mysterious green black stone that was found during a raid on a cult in the swamps of New New Orleans. During this raid the police led a search party into the swamps in search of several disappeared disappeared people. Two police found their burnt and mutilated bodies. It's very dark. <laughs> it's the, extremely dark. In the I haven't read this. In the <laughs> in the centre this is all Elena. Um, in the centre of a cult circle the cultists confessed to worshipping the great old ones of Cthulhu, old gods that had gone into hiding until one day they would rise from the waters and bring Earth under their control. In the final instalment, Thurston discovers an article referencing a ship with only one survivor that was attacked by a group of cultists um, who killed almost everyone aboard. The only survivor, Johansson, was killed suddenly during an encounter at the docks. His widow provides Thurston with a manuscript written by her husband that describes the fate, of, the fate of those on the ship when they sailed into a city of nightmares and accidentally opened a portal that summoned Cthulhu. Mm. After finishing this manuscript, Thurston realises that he's now a possible target, thinking, I know too much, and the cult still lives. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's that amazing gothic frame that twists and turns and then you know you everybody gets um, you've got the manuscript you're in real big trouble mm. too much yes. knowledge again yes one of those yeah. one of those it's about yeah. to give you nightmares really mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah as are all of his books mm. oh i don't know that i've read all of them but the ones i have read uh, certainly yeah there's a reason i don't stop in the library for a reason <laughs> because i think it would just be it's just too much for a lot of people yeah, yeah. i think like yeah. love crafty and horror mm. it's hard to I wish Eleanor was yeah, here soon. Really if Eleanor could yeah. give us a definition of it, if she was here, I mean, I don't know what the official definition is. Lovecraft. I, I think of, yeah, utter torments <laughs> and you know, big dimension straddling <laughs> evil. That's what I think of when I think of. Sort of M. R. Jones crossed with um, uh, Indiana Jones crossed with yeah. um, Stargate. It's yeah, yeah, it's just yeah, the dimension straddling. Yeah. A bit like steampunk. Yeah, you know, steampunk. Like yeah. yeah, all kind of yeah, just yeah, it's um. It's, and it's certainly Thank epic you, as well on scale. Yeah. That, that, yeah, it's a series. Thank you, Thank you for Eleanor. reading that on Eleanor's behalf. From the desk of Eleanor. From the desk of Eleanor. <laughs> 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 what it should say. She's got the. Are you going to go next? Sure, I'll yeah. go next. <laughs> so, um, so I chose the woman in black. Uh -huh. <laughs> now she's not a monster in terms of a beast like a mm. creature mm. but I kind of took monster to mean something that you're very scared of and I find her terrifying <laughs> 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 because I don't know do, do you know the story of the woman in black you're kind of aware of it at this but maybe not the younger table. ones who shouldn't read it wrong. but this is a very very classic uh, gothic and um, a man named Arthur Kipps, Kipps goes to an isolated house that's kind of in a marsh to, I think it's to deal with some legal papers, I haven't read it for a while, but um, he comes across the, well he doesn't come across it, but in the grounds and in the corners of the room he sees 
this woman all dressed in black and in the Victorian times when this is set I think is it Victorian it's he's, set he's, he's late Victorian she's early early yeah sort yeah. of yeah. although of course she's only just died so mm. well, no not sure her her sister's only just died mm. yeah so there's kind of a bit of a you know time Ooh, jump time but jump, yeah. when someone died you would wear um morning clothes and you'd wear full black and you'd have a fully black um veil, veil like and a big black skirt yeah, yeah and you, exactly and you'd have to wear it for a few years sometimes some people would um so that's what he's seeing and <laughs> that's just the image of that is just so terrifying <laughs> have you seen pictures of the morning dress like queen victoria in the big black she, wore it for like 40 years ago. Yeah, she did, did. But it's quite an ominous image, you know, it's big and well, like takes up space. Period of modern, right? True, true. But well, the it, even um even when George the Sixth died, um there's an image of the Queen, Queen Princess Margaret and the Queen Mother wearing full coat I mean coats down to below their knees, but mm. they're wearing black veils it's mm. really quite striking i think it's the mm. veils as well because yeah, it covers it your veils, face yeah. and you can see it a little bit yeah. but obviously when it's black it's not like a wedding veil mm. it completely obscures mm. you and um just the image of that is quite scary and what this book does well is <laughs> what's scary is what you don't see not what you do see sometimes and it's kind of the glimpses of something can be more scary than it being stood in front of you does that make sense whereas some of these beasts they're scary for a different way because mm. they're big and they'll attack you like a dragon. Mm. <laughs> but this is a kind of different type of spook. Mm. But also, I don't want it's hard to say it without just spoiling too much. But her character, she's a monster in the fact that all of her sort of human emotion is gone. <laughs> and that can make someone quite scary. Mm. Similar to Victor, Victor, Victor. Frankenstein, yeah. 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 That kind of makes you a different type of monster in a way because you are selfish, I suppose. Selfishness and... That kind of like the play version where they have the woman in black mm. and the actress doesn't it she doesn't do a bow she's not in the program no, she's not no. in the and program and it's like she's knowledge, actually yeah. there my, yeah my mum and my aunt went to watch it and they and they, were, and they told me all about it and they're like it's really scary it's terrifying and don't you think it would be less scary if you did find out about the character and she, yeah, they, you found would, out too much about it yeah and it, it would just kind of like ruin it almost cause yeah like, oh okay so this is where they're doing it a mystery and I think mm. um, especially because also makes like the reader think whether it's actually real or not mm -hmm. because there's no backstory on them like no one knows anything mm -hmm. and so you're just kind of like wondering you fill in the gaps as well with <laughs> other things like some kind of weird story mm -hmm. I mean that's where the movie of this kind of falls short it tells you a little bit too much the book doesn't really do that um Hints and, and it, rumors, isn't it's it? hints People and rumors. It. Yeah, whereas in the movie, it's very much, oh, this is what happens, and this mm. is all the backstory, and blah blah blah. And then you see her full face, you see everything, and it's us oh, not scary anymore. Yeah, it loses Detracts its from it, yeah. yeah, it loses yeah. its scariness. Whereas in the book, it's never that. It's always just little glimpses. And I always think of it as a miasma because it, it it's it's so memorable. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember when it came out, and um, a reviewer said looking at back at it at a, a few years later she there was a big gap between this and the next book and they said it's almost as if she's lost this is so intense she's lost mm. the power of storytelling mm. um that it's just somehow because it is it's it's so hideous mm. um, but it's so simple as well i yeah, think that's so what simple. makes it so scary as well it doesn't yeah. always it have like, to be a big um, elaborate I mean, she's very good at, at this sort of things i'm the king of the castle um the small hand Yes, I've Red got all hand. of her um, short horror mm, yeah, stories. Back, yeah. yeah, things like that. And there's oh, yeah. there's another one, Dolly. Yes, that one's scary. Yeah. But they're all very good at telling you just as much as you need to know. You yeah. know, it kind of sprinkles it in, people, and yeah, more. exactly. Yeah. Especially yeah. with horror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a Show different different bad. type of monster, yes. <laughs> but she still really a scary one. Who wants to go next? This is a lot of movement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Um, so it might be a slight reach to include this one in the topic, but it is my favourite book, so it is a chance to talk about it a bit more. Um, <laughs> it is, of course, Jurassic Park yeah. by Michael Crichton, obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I think it might <laughs> be, yes. Something different from Fusion Lit Sucks, you know. <laughs> I promise I will discuss a different book next time, but it is my favourite book, so why not talk about it? So everybody, I'm assuming, just knows the plot of Jurassic Park. It's... Um, theme park meets dinosaurs what more could you want really in a novel <laughs> it's absolutely um, nope. my favorite bit. monsters <laughs> <laughs> so they're not really a traditional monster but certainly how they're portrayed in the novel they are actually terrifying and um, i'm very glad they're extinct <laughs> reading the novel so we don't have to to deal with that but the um the reason i wanted to talk about it is i think that the novel is quite thought-provoking you do think you're going to get a read about terrifying monsters which you do but um, the author does invite you to consider morality and what does make a monster. Mm. And actually by the end of the novel, so without any spoilers, you do end up quite sympathising with the monster of the story of the dinosaurs. Um, certainly for me, I did feel quite sorry for them. They didn't ask to be created. They didn't mm. ask to be portrayed as a monster. So mm. it does invite you to um, question that and um, to consider it. There is um, quite a poignant scene in the book um, which isn't included in the film, so I can talk about that without um, giving anything too much away. Um, but the uh, children in the novel, they're slightly younger, so a little bit more innocent in the novel, and um, the author does change the perspective that the characters tell the story, so quite often you do get to see things from the child's point of view. And um, it's very interesting because I think as an adult you do you do forget the innocence um, of the children seeing it. Um, in one particular scene they do bring down a dinosaur between the two of them mm. and the uh, boy is actually, he makes a comment that he's humbled by seeing this monster actually felled and um, you do actually do get quite a sympathy for the dinosaur itself. But um, the author had an absolutely fascinating life and the novel is a testament to his research about cloning so again just by reading the novel you do get further reading almost because he was a very very educated man and he's written so many novels under different pseudonyms so he's very he's got so many different author voices and um i think that's such a talent that you actually couldn't pick his book out of a lineup because he really can change his narrative mm. and it's absolutely fascinating read. I really recommend you read it. Um, in the novel, he does explore the idea of morality. So the idea of morality comes in on what makes a monster and um, he makes quite a point several times of the dinosaurs perhaps having a conscience in what they're doing. One of the characters in the second novel studies um, predators so she uh, brings her knowledge of watching the animals hunt and the point is made that there are certain types of dinosaurs that hunt um, to eat and some that hunt to, for the thrill of the kill, effectively. And it's um, really, really interesting and quite thought-provoking. And um, again, one particular scene, um, the, the character that studies predators, she discusses the idea about whether animals do have a conscience and um, I think that fits quite nicely with the theme as well, whether monsters are doing it with a conscience or if they, they can't mm. help themselves effectively. Mm. Um, so really do go and read it, because mm. I've mentioned it twice, so it must be good. <laughs> <laughs> and if I've sold you on that, it does also have a sequel, The Lost World, so make sure you read both novels if, you, if I've grabbed your attention. Have but you seen, who's seen the film? Jurassic Park because it is quite old oh, now it, it is like, yes I'm showing my age 90s. a bit I think I'm um, having it as my favourite book <laughs> <laughs> well the book is even though the film was early 90s and it, it yes. was a big splash because it's like oh yeah. that how amazing these dinosaurs Spielberg, are and it's amazing it was Spielberg. how often yes. Spielberg films monsters yes. mm -hmm. look at it mm -hmm. Jaws the what Jurassic Park. Oh, there's yeah. been loads of sequels. There's, there's a whole oh, franchise yes. now. There's Jurassic World. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, I don't know when the most Jurassic recent World? was. Yeah, there was Jurassic. Yeah, they did it with what's his face, Chris Pine. Is it? That's yeah. it. There's a new um, one coming out soon. Like, I'm yeah. ready for that. It's a whole franchise, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, we're thinking of the original, the, yes. the very first one. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've read the book as well. And actually, um, the film. Obviously, this is kids' law films. They, they have to remove things, but mm. the book is a very different experience. It's a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. 
for a mature audience, I would say, I the book. So. But, but you could still read it, I would say, younger mm. readers. Um, it's not too gory, the book, I no? would say. The film no. is probably worse, so the book, I think, if you, I, I really don't like gore, but um, <laughs> so if I can handle the book, I think it'll be fine. There's, yeah. But there's there's more depth to the book. It's also like reaching science again, isn't it? Mm. He does, he's very good. Crichton is yeah. very good yeah, at that. He, he, he does yeah. talk about the science. It's, it's a lot does. more intelligence mm. to the novel than there is to the film, mm. unsurprisingly. Um, and also, yeah, there have been changes. Um, you, when you talk about oh, what is a monster and who is a monster, I would say the th- um, the, ca- the character of the way Richard Hammond. Mm. Is, sorry, Richard, John, Richard Hammond. Uh, is it, is it John? Uh, what's his name? John Richard Hammond. Attenborough, Richard sorry. Oh, Richard yes, Hammond is yeah. a top gear man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say Richard Astor. We, we didn't mean it. We didn't mean it. I didn't mean that. You're, you're not a monster, Richard Hammond. <laughs> no. Jeremy <laughs> <laughs> Clark's. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, there's not even for them being monsters. But anyway, Richard Attenborough, his character, John Hammond. That's why I said Richard Hammond. Right. John Hammond. John Hammond. He's the theme park owner. Right. There we go. There we go. Just to clear that one up. <laughs> yeah. But um, he's quite. You know, he's sort of a benevolent figure, isn't he, in the film? Mm-hmm. But he's definitely not in the book. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, he could arguably be one of the He's, monsters yes I, I would agree definitely yeah. with that so, for sure yeah once, de- you, once you once you you cast it Richard Attenborough in his, his yeah. older years yeah mm. he can't yeah. do it I mean, you might have played mm. Pinky in Brighton Rock well, he when did. he was yeah. a young man, yes. but, I, but yeah, then you have a national treasure, so there's no way yeah. you can play yeah. a, yeah. a nasty, yeah. <laughs> nasty yeah. type yeah. in all the years. When I watched Jurassic Park, I grew up watching Andy's Dinosaur Adventures on the TV. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then what's on? Or did you watch Harry and His Bucket Full of Dinosaurs? Yeah. yeah. I don't think I ever did. Then there's Dino. Oh, and then watching a Velociraptor open a door. Ah, like uh, yeah. <laughs> I think Jurassic Park has done a lot for the reputation of Velociraptors. Yeah, no one had heard them before. Very, <laughs> Jurassic Park. The CGI is not very. I mean, I understand it was like back in the nineties, but mm. they're not. They're not as big as that. They're quite small, apparently. Interestingly, with that particular scene, um, the uh, creative team had actually made the dinosaurs hissing, and then Steven Spielberg came and watched it, and he said, "What is this, guys? They they didn't hiss in real life. What is this? Sort it out." And they had to reshoot the whole of the scene with um, different puppets, and so it's really, really quite interesting. Um, well, we know yeah. they might have actually sung because they really <laughs> yeah, exactly. Come on, none of us were around sixty-five oh, million years ago, were we? Now, so realised they weren't feathered. No, yes. not in those days, they didn't. No. Giant. Nobody knew. No. It's amazing how knowledge has moved on. Um, yeah. And if you are looking for something scary, it is uh, one of the books where I actually did drop the book when reading it because it really did frighten me. It was the um, kitchen scene, and um, the film doesn't do justice to just how scary that is in the book. So um, I was actually sitting on the train reading, and I actually just dropped the book because I, it, it took me to a different place. But no, it's really, um, really well. Yeah, writing there. Yeah, so it, it's really, really fantastic. But it, it does um, lead you on to further reading, and um, even if you just read his biographies of him, absolutely fascinating man, mm. and um, sadly passed away quite young. Mm, I think for his age, he was um, quite a young man when he passed, but he achieved so much, mm. and... Um, his novels um, are absolutely incredible. So, if you don't like the idea of dinosaurs, then just have a Google him and have a look at his other <laughs> novels because he's incredible. Yeah, he's really, really educated man. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me talk about my favourite book again. That's all right. <laughs> you can go next time on it if you want. Yes. <laughs> One day. I Do think. a presentation. Yeah. All the whole works. Uh, okay. Sure. Um, <laughs> someone's mask here, by the way. Is it yours? Uh, not mine. Oh, it's yours. It's yours. Oh. Sorry, I only I insist that right. just trying to decide. No, I don't want to be for me, I want to for you. Ah, I wash my hands. <laughs> All right, so, you know, me being me, I, I was very lateral in my thinking in this, and I went for um, <laughs> Nurse Ratched from yeah, uh, nice. Ken Casey's great novel, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which is something that, uh, a book <laughs> that some of you might have heard of, um, but essentially she yeah she's she has trans she she certainly has she's transcended the novel she's um she's almost become like the sort of uh figure that that you first think when you think of like a tyrannical nurse uh you know the the sort of formidable scary nurse who roams the wards and says and everyone's scared of her and that's basically what nurse ratchet is now she um ratchet is of course a wordplay on wretched she's wretched she's horrible Mm -hmm. um and she's also that spanner sort of uh, yeah, ratchet, ratchet up. up. Ratchet yes, up. Mm-hmm. yes, she she does do that. Now, in the way that you know, you mentioned about the lack of emotion, she is quite emotionless. The way that she sort of runs the ward, she makes decisions without emotion. She doesn't let emotions get. She's very calm and precise and clinical. 
and she runs it with a sort of iron fist by doing sort of routine iron routine unbending um repetitive routine that grinds everyone down um and she sort of like um punishes them in like really sadistic ways you know she sort of plays on their guilt and you know finds their neuroses and picks at them and then she turns them against each other and uh, that's that's how she runs it now she is a product of the corporation of the organization mm-hmm. so you know is she a monster yes but it's also you know kezzy's it's like the sort of struggle between freedom and um being feeling trapped mm-hmm. and feeling imprisoned mm-hmm. which is what all the impatience of the mental hospital are yes. you know they're, they're very much trapped and she sort of uh is a product of this organization that is about you know the, all these unorthodox slightly crazy people mm. um she represents what like the order tight order convention and then um rp mcmurphy who's the main she, he's not the narrator, the narrator is the chief chief bromden but uh rp mcmurphy the uh who has gone there because he doesn't want to sort of uh, serve a prison sentence he thought oh yeah i'll just live in in comfort and luxury on this place on this ward um he sort of like represents freedom because he's like a free spirited rebel and he upsets her um order and he starts playing around with it and uh, nurse ratchet starts to lose control her, you know her tight order starts to sort of disintegrate and fall apart a bit um so yeah so you know she, she's it's the the way she sort of humiliates I've, I've already said she picks people's neuroses but she threatens them with electroshock therapy as well so there are sort of diabolical yes, consequences yeah, it, it's a big deterrent. And of course, she also has her sort of staff that she runs. There's the orderlies who she sort of bosses around and dominates in a different sort of way. Um, and as Miss Huntley says, yeah, she has sort of transcended this book. I mean, you know, this book is a great book when? for all sorts of reasons. It's set in um, the 1960s when it was written, contemporary at the time. So it was, it's, you know, the Beat Generation, who I think we've mentioned before, you know, who sort of like was suspicious of um, convention and authority. Um, he was one of them, one of the brigades. So, you know, you people like Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg. America, as a, it's a microcosm of yeah. America at the time because America was involved in this hideous Vietnam War mm. and um, trying to trying to impose order, but sending very young men off basically to die in, you know, a foreign land for the sake of trying to keep communism out of the United States. Yeah. And this is about order versus... Commun- um, yeah. Communism was the bogeyman Freedom. that, that yeah. they, they wanted it. And, yeah. and so, look, if Nurse Ratchet is the monster, then McMurphy is the hero. She's the dragon. He's the sort of knight in shining armor, if you like. And so it's like, you know, it's about the power struggle. And it folds over. And it's very, very, it's very funny in places. But it's ultimately quite heartbreaking, too, this mm. book. Um, but it is a great book. And, yeah, Nurse Ratchet, not just because she's the, the, the embodiment of this sort of stereotypical matron that everyone's scared of, uh, she also has her own Netflix series nowadays. Yes. Um, those of you got Netflix um, called Ratched, and it's basically it's the story of how she came to be, how she, like she is, you know, this sort of what? How did she become such a monster? Because uh, you know she is, um, even by other medical people's standards in in uh, mental institutes, and it shows her backstory. And it is quite a dark. I don't know if anyone's seen it, the Ratched series, but it is quite dark. Mm-hmm. It is quite a dark it backstory. Mm-hmm. It is a bit surreal. And um, it's got a really fantastic credit sequence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so she has become embedded in popular culture, really, as a Nurse Ratchet. So yeah, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Great Which novel, great monster. A film. Also a fabulous mm-hmm. film with uh, Jack Nicholson yes. as R.P. McMurphy. And I can't remember the name of the actress who played Nurse Ratchet, no, but they both won Oscars, really. didn't they? They did. Um, for it. And in fact, Paul Gambaccini, uh, just before the Oscars, always does a programme about... Um, that a particular year and he has does one on one flew over cuckoo's nest and talks to david thompson the great film historian and why it made such an impact and it's all it's it's the, the chemistry isn't it between all the mm. part the, the actors and particularly casting jack nicholson mm. yeah who just yeah because mcmurphy is like a sort of trickster type isn't yeah. he he's, he's the sort of like yeah. the rebel yeah, and that had with a cause. <laughs> one of many parts of that era that he undertook. Yeah, obviously it was his golden era, wasn't it? Chinatown. Yeah. And when did the film come out? Early seventies. Um, I think it was yes. mid. Uh, yeah. It probably says yeah. in here somewhere. Like um. Yeah, the book. So this is nineteen sixty-two. Yeah, it was a while later. So either way, it wasn't that. It was still fairly set around the same time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, this was written the '60s, and yeah, we're on the verge of this of, the, of free yeah, love and everything. Inspirational person, isn't he, for a huge beat for the beat. Oh yeah, absolutely, well. Kerouac, Ginsberg, yeah. 
all those guys, yeah. So different Absolutely. So yeah, so one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. Thank you. A different sort of monster. Mm-hmm. Right, who's next then? I think that's Lulu. Lulu? Oh yes. Oh she's got I was just thinking of that. Well done. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking of it when you were speaking about Frankenstein. Um and okay. I was also thinking about my outrage about having to compare Frankenstein to Never Let Me Go at A level. And I think this would probably be a much better book to compare it to. Um, so for those of you who don't know, To Kill a Mockingbird is a book about growing up um, in the 60s, no, not 60s, 30s, in, yes, um, in the it's South. In it was 60s. written in the 60s. All my GCC yeah. knowledge is coming from back to me. Um, but yeah, um, growing up in the 30s in the South, um, uh, a time with the Jim Crow laws, so basically black people weren't equal to white people in mm. society, um, like by law. Um, and so that's a that's a big, lots of the story sentence around um, a case against a black man that is very clearly unfair, like that's not a spoiler, <laughs> it's just, it's, mm. it's not the vibe. Um, but, um, but another big part of the story is Boo Radley, and Boo Radley is the neighbor of the main girl, um, in this book, who I've just literally forgotten her name, Scout, um, and all uh, all her life she's been absolutely terrified of Boo Radley, um, and yeah, uh, he reminds me so much of the creature because yes. although the difference is that he's never actually seen, and kind of like the creature, they've built up this narrative about mm. him. And I can read you a bit about... Yeah, of course, um, what's interesting is that they compare him to Dracula, don't they, because of Dill's obsession with that film. But, yeah. of course, in reality, it is, he is the creature. Yeah. So it says, um, yeah. Inside the house lived a malevolent phantom. You'll be losing that quote so much. <laughs> People said he existed, but Gem and I had never seen him. People said he went out at night when the moon was high and peeped in windows. When people's azaleas froze in a cold snap, it was because he had breathed on them. Any stealthy crimes committed in Macon were his work. Once a town was terrorised by a series of morbid nocturnal events, people's chickens and household pets were found mutilated, although the culprit was Crazy Addy, who eventually drowned himself in Barker's Eddy, people still looked at the Radley Place, unwilling to discard their initial, initial suspicions. A black person would not pass the Radley Place at night, he would cut, ac- cut across the sidewalk opposite and whistle as he walked. The Macon school grounds adjoined the back of the Radley lot. From the Radley chicken yard, tall peak and trees sh- shook their th- fruit on into the schoolyard, but the nuts lay untouched by the children. Radley Pekins would kill you. A baseball hit into the Radley yard was a lost ball and no questions asked. Mm. So that's they've basically built up this whole narrative about this poor man mm. <laughs> who lives in this house and it goes into a bit about kind of what actually happened. But um yeah, it just reminds me so much of the creature. Um and although can I spoil the ending? Or no. Um yes, we've had a little sock on Mark yes, we have. Bird. We have indeed, and we have the map. And we have the, the map. We do. Yes. Yes. On the so, so yes. yeah, go for it. Are yes. you going to kill a mockingbird? Yeah, um, you have. Next year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I've read it, but yeah, cool. Yeah, really so basically, at the end, um, I won't tell you how it happens, but um, Scout does end up meeting Boo in person. Mm-hmm. Um, lovely, and lovely encounter. Yeah, this is the description of him. He was still leaning against the wall. He had been leaning against the wall when I came into the room, his arms folded across his chest. As I pointed, he brought his arms down and pressed the palms of his hands against the wall. They were white hands, sickly white hands that had never seen the sun, so white they stood out garishly against a dull cream wall in the dim light of Jem's room. I looked from his hands to his sand-stained khaki pants. My eyes travelled up his thin frame to his torn shirt. His face was as white as his hands, but for a shadow on his jutting chin... Um, his cheeks were thin to hollowness his mouth was wide there were, shad- there were shallow almost delicate indentations at his temples and his grey eyes were so colourless I thought he was blind his hair was dead and thin almost feathery on top of his head when I pointed to him his palms slipped slightly leaving greasy sweat streaks on the wall and he hooked his thumbs in his belt a strange small spa- spasm shook him as if he heard fingernails scrape slate but as i gazed at him in wonder the tension slowly drained from his face his lips passed into a timid smile and our neighbor's image blurred with my sudden tears hey boo i said yeah. and that's a description that made a girl in my class <laughs> cry and yeah, that was, um, really that was very cute yeah. um but yeah so boo is a big part of this novel um and as you both will find out um he's compared a lot to the black characters in this novel as someone who is completely ostracized he's so isolated yeah he's, he's isolated um, it's like he didn't really do anything that 
like that wrong but society is just deemed him a complete outcast and he's just regarded as this person who just should not be interacted with at all any mentions of him are bad and it's just he doesn't deserve it yeah um i think the other way um, many people do read it i i am inclined to agree it's like the treatment of neurodivergent especially autistic people yeah um well it's an interesting novel in the fact that he is he's clearly disabled by the time he he um has got to uh middle age because that's effectively what he is now and it's part it's it's to do with the parenting yeah um and um that's really radical for for when she wrote it um, you know to question how people bring up their children yeah exactly in the 60s yeah so yeah um yeah. boo great monster even though he's a only a human you mm. start to consider who's actually the monster the children mm. yeah. who provoke yeah, again, him yeah. Yeah. Again, like or him but yeah um i love to kill a mockingbird it turned into one of my favorite books then Mm. after it that's brilliant thank you very much great i shall finish off okay (laughs) so just to finish off uh my feeling about the creature is that because he's um, because he's con- created out of dead things, I always think he's still out there. Um, yeah. well. That's sad because he says, like, right. the last thing he says is, "I want to die." Well, <laughs> my spirit, w- my spirit will sleep in peace, or if it thinks, it will not surely think thus. Farewell. Um, he's going to put himself on his funeral pile, but um, he sprang from the ca- cabin windows. He said this upon the ice raft which lay close to the vessel. He was soon borne away by the waves and lost in darkness and distance. So you never see the flames, you never see, you're never quite sure. Um, and uh, and I think as Sedgwick says, you know, he's escaped from the pages of the novel. Um, there are all sorts of, you know, TV things and sequels and prequels. Um, and it's really sad because he had so much to offer and uh, lasted at birth, really. Uh, being given life and um, you know hating his creator and his creator hating him too it's really sad so monsters mm. and how we shouldn't other exactly yeah yeah thank you everybody that's thank great you. thank you everyone thank you okay bye and have a lovely holiday and uh, come back safely yes and yeah and read lots read lots yeah three day yeah. goodbyes again yeah bye, bye everybody bye. happy bye. easter Ah uh, yeah, just press up. 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 Ah uh, yeah, just.